with the same Bible study that we were looking at this morning. We'll just go ahead and finish out these last few numbers. Uh, next week, Ben will be preaching on Sunday morning, so I um, wanted to finish this. That way I didn't lose track of it, and while it was on everyone's mind, we could just finish out the rest of these. All right, so we finished this morning with the number five, but now let's look at the number six, and we'll start in uh, Daniel chapter three. Daniel chapter three is where we'll start. If you were to do a study like this on your own, you'd see that some of these these numbers could go a few different ways. Uh, two, another another uh, prominent theme that you see with two is surety, like the mouth of two or three witnesses shall everything be established. You see things like that with two a lot, two witnesses or that sort of thing. So, uh, but the most prominent would be division, uh, one being unity, two being division. Right now, number six here, we'll start in Daniel chapter three. And if you look at what other people say about these numbers, uh, you'll see minor differences in how people take some of these verses and interpret them. Um, I'm present, presenting this to you the best, as best as I can figure it out and see it. And like I said, this is just a, a cursory study here, relatively simple. It would take it would take months and months and years upon years to really expound upon this from the Bible. And I know there are people that they give themselves to that. Um, I, and it, it is very interesting and I appreciate that. But I think if we were to do something like that here, everyone would most likely, uh, quit coming to church. <laughs> if, if I said, we're going to do a six month Bible study on numerology from the Bible. Um, it might be exciting for a couple weeks, but after a while, I think you'd get the picture. And uh, the, the point is to realize that it's a very deep book. And although it's good to study these things and to take it as far as you can, um, that does not necessarily mean that it's completely expedient. Um, like with some of these doctrines, they become very heady. And if you're a church, if, if we become a church that's just all about studying all this doctrinal stuff, we miss out on a lot of the practical things. And there's some heady doctrines out there that are church killers. One of those is Calvinism. Calvinism's a church killer. And they, they stick on that, and that's all they talk about and go over. And if you listen to Calvinist preachers, it comes out in every message. I mean, they just can't help but bring it out. And if you meet Calvinists out on the street corner or wherever and talk to them, you always, you can always find out someone's hang up, what they're hung up on, because it's, if they have a hang up, it'll come out right away. You meet with these people that are big time conspiracy nuts or anti-Semitic or whatever. The first or second time you talk with these people, they're going to try and bring up something about the Jews or some conspiracy or something. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. When I meet Christians and I want to know what this Christian's all about, if we get to talking about church and God and the Bible within a couple of conversations, then I know, okay, maybe there's something to this person. But if they want to bring up some pet doctrine or pet thing of theirs that they're hung up on, that's a false balance is what that is. So Calvinism's a church killer. Another one is hyper-dispensationalism. It's a church killer. I know a church in Ohio that they, they went hyper, they became hyper-dispensationalist, and that's, once again, the all six of them were extremely excited every single week about studying the doctrines of grace and Cornelius Stamm and uh, Richard Jordan and all these these things that they write about uh about dispensationalism, and at the end of the day, all that that does is get your brain excited about dispensationalism. You don't take any of that out with you into your life and try and help people and minister and try and lead people to the Lord with that stuff. It just goes to your head. And as a pastor, it's good It's good for me to know that stuff so I can refute it, but um, by God's grace, uh, we don't want to be a church that just gets hung up on one pet doctrine or something that that kills the spirit, kills the zeal, kills the excitement. Uh, I like teaching doctrinal things, but you always got to remember, knowledge puffeth up, charity edifieth. So that knowledge, and the more you know, and the more you know, the greater the danger becomes that you're going to become proud and essentially worthless. There's a lot of worthless Christians out there that, because they know so much stuff, they're hypercritical that they're not doing anything with it. And I know guys that, not, not guys that I went to school with, but guys that went to school where I went to school that get that way. 
They'll sit in a church for 10, 15 years, and the longer they're there, the more they're studying and learning stuff, the more hypercritical they're getting and the less and less and less they're doing. And next thing you know, they're, they're having home church in their living room with their family because they have no zeal, no excitement. They only want to go over the stuff that they know and it makes them feel important. You get, you get in a position where because you know so much stuff, you start to deceive yourself into thinking that that makes you something. And it doesn't. doesn't make you anything. All right. That's why he says to him that thinketh he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing as he ought. <laughs> or therefore, or he says, take heed lest he fall. All right. Let's, <clears throat> excuse me. Let's look at Daniel chapter 3 in verse number 1. There's a big difference between knowing things and how to, how to use those things to help people. You can know a lot of stuff. That doesn't mean you know how to use it to apply it to the Christian life. Daniel chapter 3 and verse number uh, 1 is what we'll look at. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits, and he set it up in the plain of Dura. All right, so only two dimensions are given, so apparently it's cylindrical shaped. It just gives you the height and the breadth, so the breadth and the width must match. So it's sort of a cylindrical. So it's the, uh, the dimensions are literally uh, 60 by 6 by 6 is what these dimensions are. All right, now that number six in the Bible is the number of man. Now, that's an easy one to get. Man is created on the sixth day. All right, when God's creating, man's created on the sixth day. So sixth is, six is man's number. Now look at Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. If you, if you study uh, numerology in the, the Jewish culture, the Jewish language and Hebrew, that sort of stuff, the, the Jews are big time hung up on numbers. They, I don't know how they pronounce the word, but it's G-E-M-A-T-R-I-A, gematria or gematria, something like that. They assigned numbers to every single letter of their alphabet, and then they assign like numerical values to words, and they, they're, they're very much into that sort of thing. One of the things I found out when reading that was, uh, their Hebrew word chai, C-H-A-I, uh, or, or Kai, however you want to say it, means life. And the, the numerical value that they assign to each of those numbers adds up to 18. So in the Jewish language, because that's 18, it's 6 times 3, 6 is a lucky number to a Jew. And 18 is a lucky number to a Jew. Which is very funny because it's the number of the beast, 666. Well, they see 666 and they think it's a lucky number. We see the New Testament and realize you're just setting yourself up to flock to the Antichrist. Now, that's just one of those interesting things that I was reading uh, yesterday. Look at Numbers or Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13 and verse number 18. It says, Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is six hundred three score and six. All right, six, six, six is the number of a man. All right, now when we get to God, God's number and divine completion is 777. Now with God, or with man, it's 6. With God, it's 7. Now something very interesting, 6 times 6 is 36. If you take 36 plus 35 plus 34 plus 33 all the way down to 0, do you know what it adds up to? 666. So, so just an interesting thing. 6 times 6, 36, plus 34 all the way down, or 35 down, adds up to 666. That's one of those things that you actually read. I've read that in several different books about that. All right, let's see here. Um, set number 6, the number of a man. Look at Numbers chapter 35. Numbers 35. And all the pagans out there, numerology is actually uh, outside of the Bible. There are people that get involved in numerology that do it on a, like they do it with uh, the stars, stargazing. They get involved in numbers and, and witchcraft and different religions, Eastern religions. They all get really, they get really superstitious and kind of uh, strange about numbers. And you can, if you just look up numerology, you can read about 10 different links that come from that. You'll find that people do some weird stuff with numbers out there. And most of those numbers that they do things with, they're wrong about. They're wrong about their numerology, at least from the word of God. They miss the boat. But there's still some very interesting stuff to it. All right, Numbers chapter 35, and look at verse number 6. And among the cities which ye shall give unto the Levites, there shall be six cities for refuge, which ye shall appoint for the manslayer. All right, so six for the manslayer. Six the number of a man. That he may flee thither, 
to them you shall add 40 and 2 cities. Right, so you got 42, 6 times 7. You got 48, 6 times 8. It's all connected with man and the manslayer. Yes. No, no, it's not. It's no, no. That the cities of refuge in the Bible were for people that accidentally murdered people, or people that accidentally committed crime. They would go to the city of refuge to wait until judgment was passed, and if they were innocent, they'd have to stay there until the until the judge died or whoever it was that passed judgment. But no, they, all these refuge cities around the world, no, it's 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 different than that. M majority of that is just uh, geopolitical stuff, trying to stir up nations and tear down governments essentially to get it ready for the Antichrist is all that that is. But no, I don't think it has anything to do with these cities of refuge here. Or, or re I know there's these big, you know, with the, the crisis in Syria and the civil war and stuff, all the Syrians being displaced and living in refuge cities around the world. No, it's not. Different types of cities of refuge not connected as far, to my knowledge, with, with the Bible city of refuges. Or city of, cities of refuge. <laughs> refuges, I don't think, is a word. <laughs> all right, and refugee is a word. All right, now let's look at another one here. Look at uh, look at Genesis chapter two. Genesis chapter two. Won't spend much time on six, but that's the number of a man. Now Genesis chapter two, seven. This is an easy one here. A lot of people recognize this one. Genesis chapter two and verse number two. And on the seventh day, God ended His work which He had made, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work which He had made. So seven is a number of divine completion. Something is complete. Seven is God's number. Throughout the Word of God, when we talk about God, seven is the number that God loves. And as far as divine completion, we think of seven days in a week, right? There's seven days in a week. But Jehovah, the word Jehovah shows up seven times in the Bible. There's seven days of creation, seven days in a week. There's seven churches that give us a complete overview of the church in Revelation 1 to 3. Christ says, I am, seven times in the Gospels. There's the seven I am's. There's seven sayings on the cross. All right, look at Exodus chapter 21. Exodus chapter 21. These sevens in the Bible are, are really over and over and over again. Exodus chapter 21. Genesis 7, Noah enters the ark. When? It's when the ark is complete. The job is done, Noah enters into the ark. In Genesis 6, God passes judgment on man. For 6, the number of man. In Genesis 7, the ark is complete. And man, or Noah enters into the ark. In Genesis 8, after the flood stops, there's a new beginning for Noah and his eight progeny. And then in Genesis 9, he's told to be fruitful and to multiply. So you've got Bible numerology in Genesis 6. Actually, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, and 10. Right, this is just occurring to me. In Genesis chapter... Well, actually, you could do it. So let's see if we could do 1 through 10. Genesis 1, you've got the creation. So you've got, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So that you can see the 1 there for unity, which we actually looked in Genesis 1. In Genesis 2, uh, we had some verses about, well, I don't know how you'd make it out of Genesis 2 or 3. Uh, 4, you could make a connection to, to the earth because Abel's blood cried to God from the ground. Genesis 5 is where death shows up. Genesis 6 is God's judgment being passed on man. Genesis 7, uh, the ark is complete. Noah enters into the ark. Genesis 8, they start over. Genesis 9, they're told to be fruitful. Genesis 10, you actually have the Gentile kingdom show up. All right, which we'll get to the rest of those numbers here in a minute. But what did I say to look at? Uh, Exodus chapter 21. Exodus chapter 21 and verse number 1. Oh, excuse me, verse number 3. If he came in by himself, he should go out by himself. If he were married, uh, then his wife shall go out with him. Uh, we won't actually, sorry, verse 2. If thou buy an Hebrew servant, six years shall he serve, and in the seventh year he shall go out free for nothing. So throughout the Bible, God does things in sevens. So there'll be seven days in a week. And then he'll say something about seven weeks. You number seven weeks and you have a feast. Then you number seven months and you do something else in seven years and have a release. And then seven times seven years and you have a jubilee. But you see God doing things in cycles of seven uh, throughout the the law of the Old Testament. All right, so look at uh, Psalm 12. Psalm 12. 
Even with God's word, there's a connection with the number seven. Remember in Joshua chapter 6, Joshua and the, the armies of Israel, they march around the walls of Babylon. How many times? Six. And then on the seventh time, they go around it. The seventh day, they go around the walls seven times. And then what happens? The walls fall down. So six days and a seventh day. And on that seventh day, they go around seven times. And the walls fall down in Joshua chapter 6. All right, look at Psalm 12 in verse number 6. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. All right, so seven stages to the purification there. All right, so God's continually doing things in sevens. When you get to the book of Hebrews, uh, you'll see that Christ is given seven titles in the book of Hebrews. He's called the heir, the heir of all things. He's called the captain of our salvation, the, our apostle and high priest. He's called the author of eternal salvation. He's called the forerunner. He's called the author and finisher of our faith. And he's called the mediator of the new covenant. All right, so those are 12 things, 12 titles given to Christ when you get to the book of Hebrews. Um, we find in the New Testament, or throughout the Bible, there's seven different baptisms. All right, seven types of baptism. There's Gentile water baptism, like we get baptized. So Gentile water baptism. Uh, the children of Israel were baptized into the Red Sea. Different type of baptism altogether. There's a baptism of suffering talked about. There's a baptism of fire talked about. Uh, there's a Jewish baptism. There's John the Baptist baptism. There's actually seven of these different baptisms that you read about in the New Testament. All right, there's seven major mysteries revealed. All right, there's the mystery of the body of Christ, the Jew and the Gentile in one body. There's the mystery of the blindness of Israel. There's the mystery of uh, the manifest or the in, the incarnation of Christ. There's the mystery of mystery Babylon in Revelation 17. All right, there's seven of those mysteries. Uh, there's seven major crises on the present earth. When you get Adam and Eve in the garden, there's seven of these major crises. There's the fall. Uh, there's the flood. There's the events in the book of Exodus. And there is four other ones that I don't have them written down, but there's seven of them. And these seven major crises actually kind of map out mankind in his history from the Garden of Eden all the way up until uh, the Lord burns it up and, and makes a new uh, heavens and earth. All right, seven, look at Ephesians chapter four. When you start to count this number seven, you'll see it's throughout. Seven is probably the most prominent number throughout the word of God that, that God does things in lists or in groups. Seven is the one that shows up just over and over and over again. All right, look at Ephesians chapter four. In verse number uh, three, or excuse me, verse number four, there is one body, one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. All right, there's seven things listed there. Seven of them. One, 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 one. Uh, what you also read is that there are seven better things listed in the book of Hebrews. All right, when you get to the book of Hebrews, the kind of the theme of the book of Hebrews is better things. All right, they had a city and we're looking for a better city. They had a covenant, now we have a better covenant. All right, and there was a testator, now we have a better testator. They had a priest, and now we have a better high priest. So when you get to Hebrews, better things shows up, or seven of those better things uh, show up in the book of Hebrews. All right, we can't go into all of them, but there's seven resurrections throughout the Bible. You can total up all these different resurrections, and there's seven major ones. All right, so that's the number seven, and that's just, when you get to the book of Revelation especially, you see that seven over and over, seven angels, seven spirits, seven candles, seven churches. You see it repeated throughout the book of Revelation. Seven horns, seven heads, that sort of stuff. All right, then there's the, the, the ten heads also. All right, now go to, uh, let's see here, go to Second Peter chapter 2, Second Peter, and that, that seven is one that, it's, it's, you could, like, that's one where you could spend months, because seven is, is such a prominent number throughout the entire Bible. Alright, now go to Second Peter, chapter two, Second Peter chapter two. We'll scoot right through these things here. Second Peter chapter two, and verse number five. It says, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness. So eight in the Bible is a number of new beginnings. God starts over with Noah. There's eight of them total. Yes. 
He's probably the eighth one to step on. Probably, his, probably the eighth one to step on. Probably all his daughters-in-law and all his sons-in-law and his wife, and then Noah's the last one to step on. There's eight of them total, though. Eight souls get on that ark. So I'd say he's called the eighth person because he's that last person to step on the ark. But that number eight, though, is significant because God starts over humanity with eight people. When they get off the ark, there's eight of them. And that eight's a number of new beginnings in the Bible. All right, that's Genesis chapter eight where that happens, where that, that new beginning starts. All right, eight people were on the ark. Circumcision for a baby takes place on the eighth day. All right, so it's a, a restart. Something happens, restarts over for him. Look at Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17. And the scientists or the doctors will tell you that eighth day is significant because for a baby, that's the day when a certain certain thing is most present. Yeah, K is most present in their blood levels. So it's they, they bleed minimal and they heal the fastest on that eighth day. All right, look at uh, Genesis chapter 17. And there's some, there's symbolism, not to get too graphic with you, but there's symbolism involved in that circumcision, and it has to do with uh, reproduction. It has to do with starting fresh, starting anew. All right, look at Genesis chapter 17 and verse number 12. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man child in your generations, he that is born in the house or brought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. All right, so God says you take those eight-year-old babies and that's or, or eight-day-old babies and that's when they're to be circumcised. Not to get too off topic on this, but I always felt bad for uh, for Abraham because Abraham, God gave that covenant or that sign of, not covenant, but that sign of circumcision to Abraham. And Abraham's an old man when he has to get circumcised. And I don't know what they had back then for anesthetics or whatever, if they could knock him out or something. But I would have been looking at Sarah like, just take a club and knock me out. I don't want to be awake through this. Uh, anyways, that, that's a sidetrack or a side. And then there's those other guys. Remember those other guys that they want to steal all of, uh, uh, who is it, Jacob's, one of Jacob's children's wives? And they make a deal with them. They say, if you come and you get circumcised, and you can have our wives. And what do the two sons do? It says they circumcise them. And when they were sore, that's what the Bible says, when they were sore, they went in and slew all the males. Oh, what a dirty trick that was they played on those guys. Um, let's see. Let's look at another one here. Look at, uh, look at Leviticus chapter 14. Leviticus chapter 14. Leviticus 14 and verse number 10. Leviticus 14 and verse 10. And on the eighth day he shall take two lambs uh, without blemish. This is this leper here. Look at verse number 2. This shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought unto the priest. There's a whole thing they have to go through there. And on that eighth day is when that leper gets to start over. Right, he comes in on that eighth day and the priest says, you're clean. He brings that offering in and, and he's free to go at that point. But that new beginning for that leper starts on the eighth day. Now look at uh, Leviticus chapter 15. Leviticus 15 and verse number 28. But if she be cleansed of her issue, then shall be, she number to herself seven days and after that she shall be clean. And on the eighth day she shall take unto her two turtles or two young pigeons and bring them unto the priest to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Right, so that eighth day is a new start for her. It's a fresh start for this woman who has an issue of uncleanness here in Leviticus chapter 15. All right, look at, uh, let's see, look at John chapter 26 or John chapter 20, excuse me. John chapter 20. Eight is a number of new beginnings. That's what, how we number things, right? Seven days. Is there eight days in a week? No, it's a fresh week. It's a new start. So we have seven days. The week is complete. The eighth day is not really an eighth day. It's just a start over, but it's a new beginning. John chapter... Oh, the one thing I wanted to say about seven that I think I didn't... I don't know if I mentioned this, but there's seven colors in the spectrum of light. All right, is there seven seven notes on a piano? Is that what that is? Seven of them? Yeah, seven notes on a piano make up a... What is that? A scale. So seven notes make up a scale. You've got seven colors. If you put pure light into a uh, one of those prisms, it'll shoot out seven different colors. All right, let's see here. Look at uh, look at John chapter twenty. Here's this eight number eight, verse number twenty four. John twenty twenty four. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. 
The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see his hands and the print of his nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Thomas gets a new beginning. He gets a new shot. He wasn't there the first time. He didn't see the resurrected Lord, and his faith wavers. And on the eighth day, he gets a new shot. And then look what the Lord says to him. Uh, verse 27, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Here's a confession that he makes, proving the deity of Christ. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. He's talking to Jesus, and he calls him his Lord and his God. Right, Because Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. And look what he says. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. That's a blessing for you and me. We have not seen him, but we believe. So that's a blessing that goes on to the church age uh, in reality there. All right, so the eighth day, Thomas gets a new shot, a new start. Now look at Genesis chapter 9. This is the number 9 now, Genesis chapter 9. You see this right early in the book of Genesis here with these numbers and what they stand for. Genesis chapter 9 and verse number 1. It says, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. All right, nine's an easy one as well in the Bible. Nine's fruit bearing or nine's the number of fruit. Or nine stands for fruit in the Bible. So in Genesis chapter 9 in verse 1, he's, he's told to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. All right, look at uh, the book of Galatians. Let me show you something with this number nine here. Galatians. Galatians is the ninth book of the New Testament. All right, nine is the number of fruit. Galatians is the ninth book. Galatians contains nine letters. Now look at Galatians chapter 5, and look what shows up in the book of fruit here. Galatians chapter 5, and verse number 22, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit... Now, so you've got the ninth book, uh, nine letters in the book, and you've got fruit showing up here in Galatians 5.22, and how many fruit of the Spirit do you think that there are? There's nine of them, right? The fruit of the Spirit is love, one, joy, Two, peace. Three, long suffering. Four, gentleness. Five, goodness. Six, faith. Seven, meekness. Eight, temperance. Nine, against such there is no law. There's nine fruit of the Spirit. All right, be fruitful and multiply in Genesis 9. In Galatians 9, there's the fruit of the Spirit. How, how long does a, does a lady bear child for? How long is she with child? Nine months, right? Nine months. So that nine is the number of fruit bearing. Now look at, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You know how old Sarah is when God promises her that she's going to have a child? She's 90. And then you know how old she is when he actually has the child? She's 99. Right? God comes in when she's 90 years old said, you're going to have a kid. And she laughs. And then they deny it. And they end up naming the kid Isaac, which means laughter. And then she's 99 when she has a child. And, uh, oh man... <laughs> God would have to give you a lot of grace to have a child at 99 years old. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 8. It says, For one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and self same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. For as the body is one, and hath memory, many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. I mean, how many gifts do you think are listed there in, that, in those two verses, or three verses? There's nine of them. All right? Nine of those gifts are listed uh, for the body of Christ. Now we understand doctrinally some of those gifts aren't in operation currently. They were in operation in the early church, but not all of them are, them are in operation now. All right? But there's nine gifts given to uh, the church. There are gifts listed 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. All right? Um, let's see here. Let's look at this last one. Now look at Genesis chapter 24. Genesis chapter 24. All right, Genesis 24. And the servant took ten camels of the, ma- of, of the camels of his master and departed for all of the goods of his master were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia uh, unto the city of Nahor. All right, now this is Abraham in his old age sends a, sends a servant uh, to get a wife for his son. All right, and she, he goes and get a, gets a wife for his son. And let's see, where else? What other, excuse me, what other verse am I looking for? I'm looking for verse number 10. And then I'm looking for verse number 55. It says, And her brother and her mother said, Let the damsel abide with us a few days, at least ten. After that she shall go. All right, so this consent of Rebecca here, uh, being married to Isaac, she's a Gentile bride for Isaac. And they take ten camels, she waits ten days, then she comes back and she uh, marries Isaac. Now, that's just a couple verses there to show you this 10. There's more prominent ones than that. Look at Genesis chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10. 10 is a Gentile number. And then 10 also is connected with human government and human law. How many commandments are there? Right, there's 10, 10 major commandments. All right, that's because that the law and human government and Gentile government in particular is connected with the number 10. All right, Genesis chapter 10 and verse number 10. In the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. That's the first Gentile kingdom. Babylon. All right, Babel. First Gentile kingdom that shows up. Genesis chapter 10 in verse 1. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And unto them were born sons after the flood. So Japheth is where the Hebrews come from. But Shem, or excuse me, Ham and Japheth, or excuse me, the Hebrews come from Shem, but the Gentiles come from Ham and Japheth. All right, all these Gentile kingdoms are listed here in Genesis chapter 10. All right, so 10 is a Gentile number. Now, go to, uh, let's see here, Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10 is a, a salient ver- or chapter in the book of Acts. It's when God opens the door to the Gentiles. All right, Acts chapter 10. And what you have here is Cornelius. Verse number 1, Acts 10, verse number 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. Right? He's a lost Gentile is what he is. And in Acts chapter 10, God opens the door of salvation to the Gentiles. Look in verse number, uh, let's see here, verse number 11. This is Simon Peter here. It says, And saw heaven opened, and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet, knit at the four corners, let down to the earth. Now, I didn't point this one out earlier, but there you see four connected with the earth again. All right, four corners let down to the earth. Verse 12, Where, where all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, there it is again, four earth, and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air, and there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord. I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice. All right? Three times the Lord's trying to get Peter to eat some of these unclean animals and tells him they're clean. You're allowed to eat them. And this is in Acts chapter 10. And look at verse 17. Now while Peter doubted himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius, those are three Gentiles. Earlier in the chapter, Cornelius sends three Gentiles to Simon Peter. The Lord gives a vision to Simon Peter to show him, look, these unclean animals are okay for you to eat now. The reason why he does that is so Simon Peter would go and minister to those Gentiles. Otherwise, he wouldn't have had anything to do with Gentiles because they're unclean. He's not allowed to go talk with them. All right, now he explains some of that later on in the chapter and shows all that to you. Uh, But there's Acts chapter 10. Uh, door open to the Gentiles. Noah is the tenth from Adam, and his genealogy is given in Genesis chapter 10. The first Gentile kingdom is in Genesis chapter 10, and the last Gentile kingdom is Babylon as well. It's mystery Babylon. Remember, it's got the ten kings. 
All right, ten kings connected with Mystery Babylon. So that ten's a number of human government. It's a number of uh, Gentile kings and Gentile governments. All right, so there's one through ten. Uh, we had unity, division, the Trinity or completion, the earth, death, the number of man, the number of God, the number of new beginnings, the number of fruit, and the number of uh, the Gentiles and human government. All right, there's one through ten. Any other questions? Yes. I don't want to go into that. It has to do with some really, really weird stuff that was going on in in Samson's day. Uh, it has to do with witchcraft and all kinds of weird stuff. It still goes on in Africa to this day, put it that way. Um, it was a pagan thing is what it was. Now, the Bible doesn't give you a ton of that information. It alludes to some of that, but it was a pagan thing, and it was not a necessarily a right thing that was going on. But Samson's got the Spirit of God, and he's, he's able to do whatever. He takes the jawbone of an ass, and he kills hundreds of people with it. Um, but it was a, a weird thing. Put it this way, I know a, um, a missionary in Africa, several missionaries in Africa talk about this, where they have, there was one time in Malawi where one missionary, I know there was a hundred orphan boys that all of them showed up castrated. They had disappeared for a few days and a, and a few days later they found all of them. And they were all castrated. And those, those witch doctors and stuff out in the bush in Africa, um, they're doing some of this weird stuff that actually is connected with what was going on in Samson's day, connected with Saul and even Solomon and occultic stuff, demonic stuff. The Bible does go into some of that, but it's really, it's satanic stuff is what it is. So does that answer that well enough? <laughs> All right, but 11, we didn't go into it, but 11 is catastrophe. All right, Genesis chapter 11, and there's a bunch of examples of it in the Bible. 12 is a Jewish number. That was very easy to get. 13 is a number of rebellion. Um, 14 is a derivative of 7, which you'll see that. 14, 21, 28, all derivatives of 7 or multi multiples of 7, and you'll see that connection throughout the Bible. Uh, 15, 16, 17, 18, all these numbers, 18 especially, being connected with 6s. And as you go up through counting these numbers out, you'll see all sorts of connections throughout the Bible with these numbers. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for an opportunity to be in church. Thank you for those that are here. I do pray that you would please uh, bless us this afternoon as we go. Thank you for the people that came this morning. Lord, it's a blessing to be in church. Lord, every time church is over, Lord, I'm I'm tired and I'm worn out, but I'm happy that I was in church. And Lord, I get excited each week as the week goes on to be back in church. Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you'd help this church here, help the people here, Lord, to be good ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, God, I pray that you help all of our members and attendants here to or take ownership in this congregation and what we're trying to do here in this town Lord God, I do thank you that we've had some visitors here. seems like the past five or six weeks, Lord, we've had visitors. Lord, I appreciate that. I pray that they're getting a blessing from your book. I pray for the local people, that you bring more of them out. Lord God, I pray that you open up doors for us this week to, to minister and to preach the gospel and to try to get some people saved. Lord, we do love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, thank you guys for all, uh, all for coming this afternoon.